From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Parker, Johnny. Shorty Mutual. Oh, hi, Joe. What's on your mind? A gorgeous doll named Dolly McLean. Remember her? Sure. The champagne dream girl. Yeah. Dancing darling of the roaring 20s. Uh, finally married Barnaby Cronin, didn't she? Right. And for a wedding present, he bought her the Circle of Fire. Oh, yeah. One of the five most beautiful necklaces in the world. Diamonds and emeralds. Worth a half a million. It's been lying in a bank vault for the last ten years since Barnaby died. We carry the insurance. So? She's coming out of seclusion, Johnny, giving a party. Just like the old days, she says. May go on for a week. Her last fling. And she's going to wear the circle of fire. Uh-oh. Get the picture? Gallons of champagne, everything mixed up, crazy. And that old lady with a half million bucks around her neck. Target. You've got a problem, Joe. Johnny, we've got a problem. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during investigation of the Cronin matter. Item one, $14.80, transportation to New York and to the apartment of America's one-time dream girl. One time, a long time ago. How do you do? I'm Johnny Dollar. I believe Mrs. Cronin is expecting me. I'm Mrs. Cronin, and yes, I am expecting you. Won't you come in? Oh, thanks. I did have butlers and maids and such for years, scads of them. But since Barnaby passed away, I've just hibernated, you might say. Oh, in here, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Ten years now in this same little apartment. As you can see, I've just been living like a little mouse. It looks very comfortable. Oh, I suppose it's comfortable enough, but... Oh, Sylvia, I'd forgotten you were still here. Mm Mm-hmm. But not for long, Mrs. Cronin. Oh, no. Please stay. We'll have some tea or sherry or something as as soon as... Oh, you two, do you know each other? No, I'm afraid we don't. Oh, but of course not. How could you? Uh, Sylvia, this is Mr. Dollar, Miss Blake. How do you do, Miss Blake? Hello. Mr. Dollar's here to talk to me about, uh, well, something or other. I'm not quite sure what, as a matter of fact. It won't take but a few minutes... If uh, Miss Blake would excuse us. Sure. Go ahead. Have at it. Well, if you'll come this way, Mr. Dollar. Uh, Don't you leave now, Sylvia. Not a chance. I just spotted your bottle of tea. I'll have one or two with soda, if you don't mind. With soda? Oh, I see what you mean. You young people. In here, Mr. Uh, Mr. Dollar. You by any chance, Johnny Dollar? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Why, Miss Blake? Just wondered. Well, he's looking at you. And, brother, I wouldn't be in your shoes for a million dollars. No? How about half a million? That, I'll admit, might interest me. Well, shall we... After you, Mrs. Cronin. Thank you. Wonderful girl, a born comedian. Yeah, she's a scream. What is she, an actress? Oh, no, no, she writes things for magazines and things like that. Uh, Sit down, Mr. Dollar. She came to interview me one time. That's how I met her. I see. She wrote a piece about my necklace, the Circle of Fire. Sylvia Blake, oh, sure. Articles about gems, famous stones, jewel robberies. That's her. Oh, she's fascinated by the subject. She's coming to my party. Oh. Why don't you come to my party, Mr. Dollar? Fine, I'd love to. In fact, that's why I'm here. Oh? Uh, Joe Parker over at Surety Mutual is kind of worried about this party, Mrs. Cronin. He's afraid you might invite people like me. What? I mean, people you don't know. You're a detective. Um, in a way. I told Joseph how I felt about that. He's not going to send any detectives around snooping into things, spying on my guests, wearing the hats in the house. Huh? Not that you're like that, of course, but it's the principle of the thing. Well, wouldn't you have a better time at your party if you knew you were safe? Mr. Dollar, it was at a party that Barnaby gave me the Circle of Fire. Our wedding reception. There were over 2,000 guests. A 1,000 of them invited. 
and we danced. Oh, we danced all night. And the necklace was beautiful. And I was beautiful back then. True, but... And then afterward, at four o'clock in the morning, we drove through the park in a hansom. Just the two of us. And the driver, of course. And I wore the circle. And I was safe, Mr. Dollar. I was perfectly safe. Maybe you were just lucky that night. Barnaby was so wonderful. And he could make living so wonderful. Well, I don't doubt it. He was probably a man who could manage things pretty skillfully. He was running two railroads in a bank all at the same time. Then I imagine he had no trouble arranging for your safety without even letting you know about it. You mean guards all around? It's possible. Yes, it is. He was like that. He never wanted anything to worry me. All right, Mr. Dollar. You win. Good. But it's only because of one reason. I like you. And I want you at my party. Thank you, Mrs. Crowley. Oh, you're going to love every minute of it. It's up in the Adirondacks. Our old summer place. Uh, Joseph told you, I suppose. Yes, he did. Mrs. Crowley. And the people I've invited. Hundreds, literally. People I knew in the old days. Of course, a lot of them won't come, but... You know, it was strange. So many of the letters came back undelivered. Mrs. Cronin. Oh, Sylvia, I didn't hear you come in. I'm the sneaky type. You've got a visitor. Says he's an old friend. Really? Well, I suppose I'd better see you. Uh, You'll excuse me, Mr. Dollar. Sure, go ahead. You and Sylvia talk to each other. I uh, brung the bottle in case you're interested. Short on the soda. Right. She's on a cloud by herself. Of course, some of the invites to the party were undelivered. Those beautiful people had a habit of dying young. Say when. When? Who's the visitor? I'll guess with you. Looks like an overgrown leprechaun. Said his name was Shorty Weber. Shorty Weber? You know him? I know of him. An old-time song and dance man, among other things. He probably worked in a show with him back in those dear, dead days. Anyway, he's got an invite clutched in his sweaty little palm. Another free loader, I suppose. Aren't we all? I am, yes. Not you, though. You're working your way. Isn't that what you're doing, one way or another? Meaning? A magazine article, just in case. Written right on the spot. Attempted theft of the circle of fire. Clever jewel Why do you say attempted? I'm working my way, remember? Sure, I remember. But it won't be attempted, Johnny. Somebody's going to get that necklace before the weekend is over. I'll bet on it. Would you care to name any names? Pick a name off the guest list. Any name. Suppose I pick Sylvia Blake. You're the detective. You've dug up and written up every big-time jewel theft over the last 50 years. You're bugged on the subject, obsessed with beautiful gems. Fits my personality. I'm rather beautiful, too, in a brittle and glittering sort of way. Don't you think so, Johnny? I think you work pretty hard at that tough act. Maybe. And I think you'd give your right arm to own that necklace. Going after that would really be going for the big one. Going for broke. And somebody will do it, Johnny. Wait and see. She left a few minutes later with the bottle under her arm and a chip on her shoulder. With the girl gone and the scotch gone, there seemed to be no point in me hanging around any longer. So I went looking for Mrs. Cronin to say goodbye. I didn't find her, but I did find her caller, Shorty Weber. He didn't hear me come into the room. He was too busy. He was hunched over Mrs. Cronin's writing desk going through her mail. You won't find it there, Shorty. Who's that? Hold it, Shorty. Don't try to reach for it. I I, I wasn't going to. Honest, I wasn't. Turn around. Put your hands up against the wall. You you got me all wrong. I wasn't going to do that. Okay, relax. I I was Uh, just coming... 38, stub barrel, clip holster. Nice gun. Uh, It belongs to a friend of mine. Bad business, Shorty. An ex-con packing a gun. Oh, I guess you're Johnny Dollar. She said you was here. And I, I, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Dollar, but you're wrong. Why, Dolly, uh, Mrs. Cronin, she's an old friend of mine. I tried to get her to marry me once over 30 years ago. A lot can I... happen in 30 years. Does she know you've served time in prison? No. Yeah. She thinks I was on tour, Europe and Australia. She never reads a paper or hears anything. Don't tell her, Mr. Dollar. Please don't. You know, it's quite a coincidence, Shorty. It was Jules that time. A big affair in New Orleans. And you were hired as an entertainer. A diamond bracelet, wasn't it? And you were caught cold. It's the only time in my life I've ever done anything like that. And I went again. Not, especially not to her. 
Why, I, I, I'm planning to look out for it at this party. That's why I bought the gun. And is that why you were going through a mail there? Yeah. I wanted to see who was coming. I learned things while I was doing time. I know how the word gets around in a big deal like this. There's a lot of wrong guys in this world. No argument, Shorty. Yeah, well, you met her. You, you, you know how she is. She's a babe in the woods on something like this. Did my ears be burning, or is it some other babe you mean? Not for me, Dolly. You're the only babe I ever could see. Oh, Shorty, you never give up. Oh, uh, do you two know each other? Uh, not exactly, but we found we had a mutual friend, a certain state prison warden. Oh, uh, how nice. Shorty's always doing benefits at those places. Uh, Dolly, yeah, uh, yeah, that was it. He did a benefit there. Oh, well, I'll bet you went over big. <laughs> well, you know. You're too modest, Shorty. Why they loved him, Mrs. Cronin, hated to let him leave. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, speaking of leaving, uh, I got a shove now. Don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> it was crazy and corny and sad. The whole idea. I guess the sadness of it hit me when I was saying goodbye to Mrs. Cronin at the door. The gaiety slipped for a moment. And suddenly she was old and tired. And at the same time, she was a scared little girl. And then she said something strange. And the shivers ran up my back. Do you believe in premonitions, Johnny? Well, I have a hunch now and then. Well, whatever it is, it's the reason I'm doing this. Having this party. One last fling, you might say. Before it's too late. Oh, come now. You're still a young woman, Mrs. Cronin. No. I'm old, Johnny. I've been old for years. Since Barnaby died. We loved each other so... But... That's not what I mean. I've had this premonition lately. What sort of a premonition? That something awful, something terrible is going to happen to me. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a man who's afraid of his shadow, a girl who's afraid of nothing, and a stranger who strikes in the dark. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Jason Prell. Jason I Pre manage Mrs. Cronin's trust fund. Oh, sure. We haven't met, of course, and I know that I'm overstepping the ordinary bounds of propriety, but I simply have to talk to you immediately, if possible. Well, can't it wait until train time? You're going with us up to a party in the Adirondacks, aren't you? Yes, I am, but it'll be too late then to make very much difference. Well, uh, maybe you could tell me the general idea of what you I want. I understand Mrs. Cronin has authorized you to obtain the circle of fire from the bank and to keep it in your possession until she wears it at the party. Yeah, that's right. Don't do it. Leave the necklace where it is. Why? It's a long story, Mr. Dollar, and it goes a long way back. The whole thing is a lot more complicated than you realize. Well, I'm beginning to realize it. Just exactly what is it you're worried about? I'm worried about Mrs. Cronin's sanity. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, New York City, to the Home Office Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. Expense account continued. Item four, a dollar and eighty cents. Taxi to the offices of the Daily Times Courier for a look at the morgue files on Mrs. Cronin. The clipping started with the year 1916, when a bright-eyed, wide-eyed kid named Dolly McLean danced her way out of the chorus lines of a two-bit musical and straight into the limelight of Broadway. One hit show after another. Hits just because she was in them. And parties, balls, social affairs. 
The Dancing Darling. A critic tagged it with a name in her first write-up, and the name stuck. So she danced. Danced away the mad, crazy years that followed World War I. And like everybody else, she lived it up. There were rumors of engagements, love affairs, the Baron this, count that, one after another. Shorty Weber was mentioned a few times. And Jason Prell was in from the beginning as a promoter, though, a business manager, not as a lover. Her friends were mentioned, hundreds of them. Then Barnaby Cronin came into the file. Boy wonder of the business world, the golden prince. Engagement, marriage, and Barnaby's fabulous gift to his new bride, a half-million-dollar necklace of diamonds and emeralds, the circle of fire. Then, Barnaby's sudden death, Mrs. Cronin's seclusion, end of file. Expense account item five, $24.30, transportation, hotel, and incidentals. And a taxi to the railway station to find the special coach Mrs. Cronin had chartered to haul her guests to the Adirondacks and to her Roaring Twenties weekend party. I purposely got there early, but one of the guests was even earlier. Mr. Dollar... Wait. Hmm? You are Mr. Dollar, aren't you? That's right, but I don't Prell, think... Prell, Jason Prell. Oh. I thought you might come down early to meet the bank messengers. Thank heaven you did. Well, I'm afraid I don't... Dollar, see... I've known Dolly McLean and Mrs. Cronin for over 35 years. All that time, I've managed her business affairs, arranged her personal contacts, been like a father to her. Yeah, I've read the newspaper clippings. Well, uh, newspaper stories can be misleading sometimes. They build things up. Sensationalism. It's true, of course, that Dolly and I had some quarrels. Who doesn't? In spite of everything, I was still her best friend. Go on. I know Dolly, know her better than anybody else in the world. I know how she's gone downhill since Barnaby died, especially in the last year or so. And I know this whole idea is the worst possible thing she could do. Have you tried talking to her along that line? She won't listen. She's dead set on it. I'm hoping you can help. How? Point out to her how dangerous it is to go off into that isolated place with a piece of jewelry as valuable as a circle of fire. It's worth a fortune. Somebody's bound to try to steal it. I still don't get what you're driving at, Mr. Prell. But I just told you. It's the risk that's involved. To whom? Why, Mrs. Cronin, of course. She knows about the risk. She's willing to take it. She doesn't know what she's doing. Hey, you said something on the phone about her sanity. Are you trying to imply that no, she's... No, no, no. Not, not yet. But she's not well. She's burned herself up back in those early years. And she hasn't much left. The only thing that keeps her going is... That's a crazy kind of belief. Belief? Dolly believes in people. So do I, Mr. Pearl. Well, yes, yes, of course. But Dolly's whole thinking hinges on it. All the people she knew back in the heyday, the people she calls her friends, in her book, they can do no wrong. She lived in a dream world, still does, like a fairy princess. But it never really existed. Things weren't like that back in those days, Mr. Dollar. So I've heard. Most of the people she thought of as her friends were only trying to use her. Barnaby and I would block them off take care of things when things had to be done and let her go on living happily in her never-never land. And now, that's the only land she has to live in. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Why, some of those friends would cut their mother's throat for a tenth of the value of the circle of fire. Those are the guests she'll have at their party. Well, I've already been told once that somebody will steal that necklace before the weekend is over. Do you want to add your prediction? I think somebody will try. And that's all that's needed to start that dream world of hers falling apart. And to make her face things the way they are. May I ask you a question, Mr. Prell? Oh, yes, of course. This trust fund you're managing that her husband left for her, just how big is the setup? Barnaby Cronin was a wealthy man, Mr. Dollar, but he had his ups and downs like every business investor. The capital is adequate for her support, but not much more. Is the necklace a part of the trust capital? It's her own personal property. Otherwise, I could have prevented it from being taken from the bank. You have complete control of the trust. Then. Yes. Barnaby knew that she had no understanding of business matters. I see. She's old, Mr. Dollar. Older than her years. Tired. All that keeps her alive is her belief in the past. Yeah. Her dream world. Where everybody loves her and protects her. Where she's still a dancing darling. And if that dream world is destroyed, she'll be destroyed along with it. Now phone the bank, Mr. Dollar. Ask them not to bring that necklace here. I'm afraid they think I was crazy. Why? Because I've got it with me, Mr. Prell. I picked it up myself two hours ago. Then heaven help us all. The convention coach Mrs. Cronin had charted for the run to the Adirondacks was arranged with a long aisle of individual staterooms and a main lounge area at one end. It could accommodate 50 people. But when the train pulled out, there were only six of us in the coach. Six. 
out of the hundreds of friends she'd had in the old days when she was in the big time and on top. And even out of the six, three of us were new acquaintances, people who hadn't known her back when. I was there, of course, because I'd been hired to be there to protect her fabulous necklace. And Sylvia Blake, still playing it tough and cynical, was probably hoping for a magazine article, or hoping for something. But the third newcomer, there was the question mark. Oh, I think this whole thing is just too exciting for words. Don't you think it's too exciting for words? Well, I... Uh... I know who you are, of course. You're Mr. Johnny Dollar, and you're supposed to protect those fabulous jewels. And I'm Laura Dean, and I think we ought to call each other Laura and Johnny, because after all, it's a party, isn't it? Up till now, I was having doubts. You're, uh, obviously not one of Mrs. Cronin's friends from the old days. Oh, no, I just met her back there at the station. You what? Well, I talked to her on the phone, of course. She sent an invitation to my aunt, who was a very dear friend of hers. Only they hadn't seen each other for years, and she didn't know my aunt had passed on over a year ago. So I phoned her and told her, told Mrs. Cronin, I mean. And she said for me to come to the party, she'd like to meet me. And I wouldn't have missed it for anything. Yeah, well, uh... Johnny, do you think they'll really have champagne in bathtubs like they used to back in her time? If they do, it'll get awful wet out. There are only six of us to drink it. Oh, gosh, I don't see how you can call six people a party. Well, the thing is, we'll all be in there trying hard. <laughs> now you're joking me. I'll bet you're fun at a party. Oh, wait till you see the act I do with a lampshade. Who did you say your aunt was? I don't think I said who. When do they start serving the champagne, Johnny? When they see the whites of your eyes. Oh, that's cute. I like that. Thanks. Now, about your aunt. Oh, poor old soul. She'd have loved this, too. You ought to hear about some of the parties she and Mrs. Cronin used to go to. Yeah, I imagine. They well, used uh... to go every place together back in those days. The newspapers called them the Siamese Twins. The Siamese... Siamese Twins. That was just an expression Fritzy like... Morell. Is that what you're saying? That you're Fritzy Morell's niece? Sure. Did you know her, Johnny? No, I never met her. Oh, you'd have liked her. She was a lot of fun. Loved a party. Gosh, I thought there were no people in this. She kept party. babbling on, and I listened to her and tried to figure her out. The chatter was smokescreen. Underneath it, she was cool, sharp, and shrewd. I didn't know what she was up to, nor why she was here. But I did know one thing. Fritzy Morell had died about a year ago, true enough. But she'd left no surviving family and no niece. Laura Dean was a liar. I hadn't seen Mrs. Cronin since we pulled out of the station. She'd greeted us, then gone right to her stateroom and stayed there. And when I saw Jason Prell come hurrying from that direction, I could read the look on his face even before he reached me. Mr. Dollar, please. Mrs. Cronin? Yes, go to her at once. What is it? What's wrong? She was suddenly taken ill, very ill. Hurry. Mrs. Cronin. Right now. Oh. It was just nerves. I've had it before. My doctor in New York gave me some tablets to take whenever... Are these the tablets? This bottle here? Yes. You know what they are, Johnny? Uh, yeah, I know. All right. So he does say it's my heart. But he's wrong. It's just nerves. Yeah, sure. That's not why I sent for you, Johnny. You have the necklace? Yeah. Want to see it? No. Now I'll wait until it's time to wear it. Johnny, I've written something here. Now I'm going to sign it, and I want you to sign as a witness. Well, uh, all right. Unless you'd rather have Jason Pro. Mm, Jason would argue about it. There. Now you sign. There you are. Keep it for me. <laughs> Do you mind if I know what I've signed? Oh, of course not. Read it if you like. In the event of my death, I, Dolly Cronin, being of sound mind, bequeath the necklace known as the Circle of Fire to Sylvia Blake. Sylvia loves jewels. She'll appreciate it. Yeah, I imagine she will. And she's not to know about this, you understand, because... Of course, it'll be years before she gets it. Oh, sure it will. Now, you'd better try to get some sleep. I'm going to. And thanks, Johnny. It was nothing. You know something? I was heartbroken when they didn't show up at the station. All my old friends. But I've been lying here thinking, and I've finally figured it out. Oh? They all went on ahead. They'll be waiting at the house. They're trying to surprise me. 
Don't you think so, Johnny? I said, yes, I thought so. But I was lying because I didn't think so. But she was still a dancing darling, and she had that way about her. You wanted to protect her. I didn't go back to the lounge. I walked down the corridor to my stateroom. It was night by then, and the corridor was only dimly lit. My stateroom was dark. When I opened the door, I caught a bare flash of movement too late. Oh! came to minutes later. I was lying on my stateroom floor, blood seeping from a cut in my head. I felt in my inside pocket for the bulky leather case that had held the necklace. It was gone. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, an old love and an old hate. And violence breaks out at midnight. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar... Hello. Dollar, you're the Mr. Dollar that's been trying to phone me? Is this Dr. Bigby? That's exactly who it is, and I'm very busy right Look, now. Look, Dr. Bigby, I want you to come out here just as soon as possible. It's the old Cronin Summer Place, about five miles up the river from where... Oh, I know where it is, I know. What are you doing up there? The house has been closed for years. Mrs. Cronin opened it up for a party this weekend, but she was taken ill on the train coming up, and I want... Is Dolly out there? Yes, yeah, she's the one I want you to look at. So she's back. After all these years, she's come back. She had a prescription from her doctor in New York, but she's taken the last of it. It's apparently her heart. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar. I'm very busy tonight. Oh, what? Much too busy, and then there's a storm coming up, and I have a patient someplace, I think. Now, wait a second. If you're a friend of Dolly's, uh, Mrs. Cronin's, do one thing. Take her back to New York. Now. Tonight. Get her out of here. Fast. Before it's too late. <laughs> From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at Wells Falls, New York, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. A half-million-dollar necklace. Expense account continued. Item 7, $5.40, taxi. I figured I'd find Dr. Bigby in one of the local pubs, but I covered them all in about 30 minutes. No sale. And unfortunately, Bigby was the only doctor in Wells Falls. Worse, the local druggist couldn't fill Mrs. Cronin's prescription. The nearest chance was Tupper Lake, 25 miles away. Back out at the Cronin place, I turned the taxi over to Jason Prell, Mrs. Cronin's business advisor, and he took off for Tupper Lake to look for the medicine. Then I went looking for Mrs. Atherton, a village woman who had been housekeeping on the estate since the place was built. I found her in the kitchen. Storm's brewing up, coming out of the mountains. It'll hit us before morning. They always come in the night. I guess you've seen a lot of storms in these hills, Mrs. Atherton. Lived here all my life, never been out of them. It's Miss Atherton, not Mrs. Oh. She's the Mrs. up in the bed, even if she is a widow. Little Dolly, Mrs. Cronin, till death do us part. Did you know Barnaby Cronin, Miss Atherton? Yes, I knew him. Of course I knew him, I worked here. Oh, yes, you were here then. What kind of a man was he? Like any other man. Not according to Dolly, Mrs. Cronin. She apparently worshipped him. Still does, in fact. Dolly's always worshipping something. Everybody was always worshipping her. She had us all dancing to her tune and without even trying. You knew her back then? She was born and raised here in the village. I thought everybody knew that. No, that's what I missed. Well, we used to work together, waiting tables at the summer hotels around here. That's where Jason Prell saw her. Told her she ought to be on Broadway. She left the town the next week. Didn't come back again till after she and Barnaby was married. And she got him to spend a fortune to build this place for her. Well, I guess he had the fortune to spend. Oh, yes. She married well. Count on Dolly for that. Always got whatever she wanted and never even had to ask. Things were just given to her, always. Yeah, probably so. But she's been pretty generous herself. 
Like uh, keeping you on here, for instance, when the house has been closed up for years with nobody using it. Oh, she's the dancing darling, all right, right to the end. Well, now, if you'll excuse uh, me... There was something else I wanted to ask you, Miss Atherton. I'm not one to talk ordinarily, but you got me started. Well, this is not about Mrs. Cronin, at least not directly. She was taken ill on the train. I don't think it's serious, but I wanted a doctor to look her over. The only one in the village seems to be a man by the name of Bigby. Bigby? He's the coroner here, but he's not a doctor. No? No, not anymore. Still calls himself one, but he lost his license ten years ago. He's a drunken sot. Yeah, I kind of figured. But he sobered up fast when I told him on the phone that the patient was Mrs. Cronin. He refused to come out, told me to get her away from here fast, and then he hung up on me. Forget him. He couldn't do her any good. But I'd, I'd like to know why he acted that way. Do you happen to know any reason? Bigby is a drunk. Who knows what his reasons are? I thought you might. Better ask him. What difference does it make anyway? He can't help her. Nobody can. What do you mean? She's come back finally. For the first time in all these years. Took sick on the train. That wasn't any surprise to her. She knew it was going to happen. Well, I guess she halfway knew. She knew. It's like with an animal. When it's hurt or sick and it comes home to die, and that's what she's done. She's come home to die. No, I think you're wrong there, Miss Atherton. I don't think she's anywhere near that sick. Barnaby didn't think so either when he came back here to die. Barnaby died here? Yes, in this very house. A heart attack, it was called. He came up on the afternoon train and... Hmm. That's strange. It was the same kind of night. A storm like tonight. Strange how things move and patterns. Were you here with him, Miss Atherton? Barnaby died alone. And the doctor? Bigby? Miss Atherton, was the doctor... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I was thinking. The bridges were washed out. Bigby didn't get here till the next morning. Wouldn't have mattered. He couldn't have done anything. Nobody could have. When it's time for a thing to be done, it's done. Nobody can stop it. Nobody. It was a strange evening. Ominous and oppressive, with a feel of violence in the air. Even the house itself added to the feeling. Furnished lavishly in a style 30 years forgotten, it seemed garish now, old and tired and lonesome. Like Mrs. Cronin herself, who'd planned a grand party for all her old friends and instead lay ill and alone in the bedroom upstairs. The queen gave a party and nobody came. All dressed up, no place to go. Yeah, gloomy evening. Jason Prell came back from Tupper Lake with a medicine. Miss Atherton served a dinner of sorts, served it in silence, and we were left to our own devices. Five guests in a mansion built for a hundred. Prell stayed pretty much to himself. Lovely Laura Dean, with that air of knowing innocence, and veigled Shorty Weber into teaching her some of his old dance routines. And they cranked up an old phonograph in the music room. And me, I just stood at an open window and watched the rain come down and tried to think. That's the perfect touch. It's exactly what the evening needed. That music? Ah, oh, Sylvia. Really cornball, isn't it? <laughs> no, no, Johnny. I, I meant the thunderstorm. An isolated old mansion. Fabulous necklace of diamonds and emeralds. A weird housekeeper. A hostess lying ill. And now rain. Shades of a house of usher. That'll make a good lead for your magazine story. I should have stayed in New York and just written it, not lived it. Oh, I thought you were the big take-a-chance girl, Miss Blake. Danger, mystery, adventure. Don't those things appeal to you? Maybe. Is there any of that lying around somewhere? There may be, before the night's over. Well, all I can see at the moment is sheer boredom. You have to know where to look. In the bottom of that scotch glass, for instance? Oh, <laughs> just killing time. Oh. Uh, I've been wanting to uh, ask you, Johnny... How'd you get that cut on your head? Uh, it's a long story. It happened on the train, I know that. You didn't have it when we left. A sudden stop. I fell over my suitcase. Sure you did. Backwards. Huh? It's on the back of your head. Somebody made a try for it, didn't they? On the train coming up. Well, I don't know what they were trying for. It wasn't time to ask. Maybe they even got it. 
That's the way you were betting, wasn't it? That it wouldn't be just an attempt. That somebody was going to get it and get away with it. Did they? Is that what happened? Is it gone? All right, just stand there and grin, then. Oh, rain. I'm going back to the city tomorrow. You are? Well, don't smother me with your pleading. <laughs> no, stick around, Sylvia. Things may get better, including the music. You know, in a way, I hope somebody did get the circle of fire. Why? What good is that fabulous necklace doing her now, lying up there? She's had everything she ever wanted. Life's been too easy on her. She doesn't deserve it. She ought to lose it. Her life or the necklace? The necklace, of course. You know, for reasons I can't go into, I think you'll be sorry you said that someday. Sorry? Why? She's a woman who's had everything. You're pretty pretty, aren't you? Hurt and afraid. Am I? You feel something big may have passed you by, and you put up that tight, bright front for protection. But inside, you're tied in knots. And what is your recommendation, Doctor? A man, perhaps? That's the usual advice. Now, you said it. I didn't. Well, you're a man, Johnny. Why don't you smooch with me? It'd be a way of passing the evening, killing time. All right. What are you... Johnny, wait! Johnny, what? Why did you do it? Because you wanted me to, I... and because I wanted to. Adventure? Mystery? Danger. Who's bored? Who's going back to the city? Those doctors are right. Mr. Dollar, could I talk to you for a minute? Why not, Shorty? What's on your mind? I don't know exactly why you call us all together in it here. It was Mrs. Cronin's idea. She set it up with me earlier. Well, it ain't got nothing to do with what I want to say. You, 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 you seen me in a bad light there yesterday at Dolly's apartment. Well... Well, you found a gun in me. You know about my record. It made it look bad. I, I know it did. But so help me, Mr. Dollar. Everything I told you was the gospel truth. Yeah. I'd break my arm before I'd do anything to harm Dolly in the least bit. You see... I've been in love with that woman for 35 years. I'd like to broke my heart when she married Barnaby. But I always knew I didn't have no chance right from the start. She was up there, big, somebody. Me, I was a nobody. But I'd still die for her any time. That's all, Mr. Dollar. I just wanted you to know. They were all there, gathered around the big dining table, watching me and waiting. Mrs. Cronin had asked me to arrange it. She said that was the main reason they'd come, and she didn't want to disappoint them. I told them that. And then I took the circle of fire from my pocket and laid it on the table. They all reacted in different ways. Laura Dean gave a gasp, and her eyes opened wide. And Sylvia... Look at it. Just look at it. Sylvia Blake was fascinated, hypnotized. Yeah, you should have seen it on her back in the old days. It sparkled even twice as much. Hmm. So that's what this is all about. It's only jewelry. I've seen it before. But there was one special reaction I was looking for, and I got it. Jason Prell's face went white. Who could imagine anything so beautiful? Mr. Prell, you seem surprised. I wasn't carrying the necklace in its case, the case you stole from me on the train. What? I was carrying it loose in my pocket. What did you do? Throw the case off the train without even bothering to... It's running away! Prell! I went after him, but he'd already disappeared somewhere down the hall. He knew the layout of the house, and I didn't. I searched the different rooms quickly as I passed, but there was no sign of him. He couldn't have reached the floors above, but he might have gone down toward the game room and lower halls. I eased my gun from its holster and started slowly down the stairs. And at that moment, every light in the house went out. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, a white lie, a bullet from the darkness, and death comes in out of the rain. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hello, Sheriff. I can't hear you for the storm. We were cut off before. Hello? Is that you, Sheriff? I said... Hello? You get cut off again, Mr. Dollar? Not this time, Shorty. Somebody cut the wire. The phone's dead. Then we got no way of getting white out. No way of getting help. No, not at the moment. And he's out there in the dark somewhere. 
He's got a gun in his nose. Tell him what he may try and do. Cody, get away from that window. Well, we know where he is now and what he intends. Because he just made a try at it. What are you going to do about him? Only thing I can do, Shorty, go get him before he gets me. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at the Cronin Estate, Wells Falls, New York, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. Protection of a half-million-dollar necklace. Expense account continued. Item 10, $135. One tweed sport jacket to be purchased on my return. Both lapels and one shoulder ripped by a bullet. Also one pair of slacks to match. Destroyed a few minutes later in the mud, slush, and underbrush in the grounds of the Cronin place while pursuing a suspect who'd already tried twice to kill me and who made a third go at it when I stepped out of the side door of the house. Tony, away from the door, quick. Whew, boy, that was close. Yeah, he could see the door opening, but he can't see us, not in this mess. He's desperate, he's shooting blind. Look, Shorty, yeah. why don't you go on back in the house? There's no reason for you taking chances like this. You're taking them? With me, it's a job of work. I get paid for it. I told you earlier how I felt about Dolly, I mean. I don't know what Jason Prell's game is, Mr. Dollar, but if it's against her, then I'm against him. I'm staying. All right, it's up to you. Thanks for giving me the gun back. Emergency, that's all. You've got a prison record, Shorty. You know what it means if you're caught with a gun. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> hey, Good. I figured Prell would give himself away if he kept that up. I got him spotted now. Where? At the base of that tall pine, a little to the left. Watch for it, the next flash of lightning. There, yeah, yeah, now I see it. I know the one you mean. Then stay here and keep him pinned down. It's a good spot. You've got cover from the wall of the terrace there. What are you going to do? Circle around and come up beside him. Just throw a shot at the base of that pine tree now and then. Keep him tied down. Keep him busy, you got it? Right. And good luck! I left the shelter of the house and started edging through the shrubbery. The undergrowth was a regular jungle. It would have been impossible to slip up on Prell without his hearing if it hadn't been for the storm. Shorty Weber fired now and then at the pine tree. And twice Prell fired an answer. Jason Prell, so-called friend of old Mrs. Cronin, knew I had him tagged. At first I'd been guessing mainly, but he didn't know it. And he'd lost his head and made the guess prove out. And now he was apparently ready to risk murder or death rather than face a prison term. I was within 30 feet of him. He hadn't heard a sound. He was still firing at Shorty over on the terrace. His back was turned partly toward me. He didn't know I was near, so I leveled my gun. Get your hands up, Prell. Drop that gun. You covered. He whirled, peering into the darkness of the bushes, trying to see me. He knew I was close, but he couldn't tell where. He raised his gun, started to turn, and... I'm not quite certain what happened next. The light was bad, and I could hardly see him. Whether he stumbled accidentally or... Or what is something I'll never know. All I know is that when I walked over to him, he was dead. He was no good, Mr. Dollar. I always thought so, but Dolly swore by me at her fool. What about Barnaby, her husband? He couldn't stand Prell at first. Later, they got his tickets, Steve's. Yeah. Well, it's a mess, Shorty, a real mess. Old things that should have stayed dead and buried on the bottom, they're all coming to the surface now. Tell me something, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? What about Dolly? Is this thing going to kick back on her? Will she get hurt by it? Yeah, Shorty, I'm afraid she will. Pretty badly. It was deep into the night, edging toward dawn, when I got back to the house. I changed out of my wet clothes, went to the game room, and got Dolly's necklace from under a chair cushion. I'd stuck it there when Pearl had pulled the main switch and put the lights out. Then I went upstairs to look in on Dolly Cronin, quietly, just to check... But it didn't work out that way. Johnny, is that you? Yeah. I didn't mean to wake you. Oh, you didn't. I've been awake most of the night. Come on in, Johnny. All right. How are you feeling? Oh, just fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. Good. Isn't Laura Dean a nice girl? Huh? Yes, yeah, she is. I'm glad she came. Company for you, Johnny. Oh, yeah. Quite a storm we had, wasn't it? Oh, it was beautiful. All that lightning, wind, the thunder. Oh, I haven't seen such a beautiful storm since I was little. Johnny, thought I heard shots a while ago. 
Shots? Outdoors. Off toward the woods somewhere. Oh, it might have been lightning, thunder. Sounded like a gun. Like somebody shooting. Well, sound plays funny tricks up here in the mountains. Uh, I guess so, but... Well, I've been thinking back over the past so much that makes the present a little unreal. I'm afraid the past is about all I have left now. Now, don't be so quick to sell this future of yours short. You've got a lot of years yet, good years. Well, I had a lot of good years. Good friends, good times, a good life. And best of all was Barnaby. You loved him very much, didn't you, Mrs. Cronin? I worshipped him. He was perfect. He never did a wrong thing in his life. Now that he's gone, he's the one fine memory I always cling to. Oh, if I didn't have that, well, I, I just couldn't go on. Well, then let's hope you never lose that memory. Of course, there were other good friends, too, over the years. Like Jason Prell. Hmm. He is so quiet. And withdrawn, it takes a long time to get to know him. But he's been such a good friend to me. So patient with all this silly ignorance of mine about business problems. Yes, I'm sure he has. I just don't know what I'd do without him. Yeah. Now, don't you think you'd better get some sleep? In a little while. You know, Johnny, it's funny how things work out. In what way? I was born and grew up right here in this village. Yes, your housekeeper, Miss Atherton, told me the two of you were girls together. We were inseparable. Like I said, I grew up here and then I went away. And Barnaby and I came back and built this house. And we went away again. There were always so many places to go, new things to do. It's a big world, isn't it? And finally, Barnaby came back for the last time. And died here. All alone, poor boy. And now I've come back. The place where I was born. Everything finally comes home. Doesn't it, Johnny? Yes, nearly always. I'm very tired. I think I will sleep now. Be good for you. The necklace, Johnny, do you have it with you? I sure do. Here you are. So beautiful. And so many memories. All so long ago. Put it on me. Will you, Johnny? Of course. Raise up now. Just a little. There. How do I look? Sweet enough to kiss. Well? Nice. You go to sleep now. Yes, sir. I'll only look at the necklace for one minute only. Then I'll take my pills and go to sleep. And then I'll dream up a dream. A great big dream. Good night, dancing darling. It's been a long time since anyone called me that. A long, long time. Good night, Johnny. And thank you. I left her and went downstairs and rustled myself a pot of coffee. I sat down by an east window and drank it cup after cup and watched the morning sun come up. Dream a big dream. Well, before many more hours, she was going to need a big dream. There was no way of keeping it from her, all of it. The fact that Jason Prell was dead, shot. That he'd attempted murder and tried to steal a necklace. And worst of all, that her beloved Barnaby had probably been as big a crook as Prell. if a girl who can't sleep sits this one out with you? Sure. Pull up a chair, Laura. Like some coffee? Just black, thank you. I guess it wouldn't do much good to ask you what's been going on around here all night. Something has? Like I said, I guess it wouldn't do much good. Here's your coffee. Oh, thanks. That's how I found you. Just followed the smell of this coffee. Mm, good. 
I guess if I said I heard somebody shooting up the place during the storm, you'd just say, really? Never use the word. And I guess if I showed you that broken window over there, you'd say maybe a pigeon flew in. Might, if I happen to think of it. I'm sorry all this kept you awake. Oh, don't apologize. I probably wouldn't have slept anyway. Why not? Guilty conscience? Don't be silly. I didn't even do it. Do what? Whatever it is I'm supposed to feel guilty about. Lying is what I had in mind at the moment. Oh, I do that all the time, but I never feel guilty about it. I just call it making up things. Like claiming you were the niece of Fritzie Morrell, <laughs> Mrs. Cronin's oldest friend. Gosh, whipped out my windpipe. Like claiming you're Fritzie Morrell's niece. Mostly I drink tea, but you already had the coffee Like made. claiming you're Fritzie... All right, all right. How'd you find out? Nothing very spectacular. She just didn't have a niece. I wasn't sure, but I thought she must. Everybody her age has at least one niece. What was the idea? Well? Well, I lived in the same rooming house she did. She liked me, talked to me a lot before she died last year. So when the invitation came last week, I got the idea of going as her niece. I didn't mean any harm by it. I just wanted to go to the party. All right, relax. That's about the way I figured it. Well, it turned out to be quite a party, didn't it? I hope I never see another one like this as... Johnny. Johnny, what's wrong with her? It was Miss Atherton. I got up slowly from my chair as she walked toward us and then stopped a few feet from the table. Her eyes were fixed on something far away and the look on her face was strange and grim. I think I knew even before she spoke. Mrs. Cronin is dead. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Cronin matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the questions and the answers for the living and the dead. The final payoff. And fate itself plays the last trump. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dr. Bigby here. Dr. Bigby. I'm asking you for the second time now to come out to the Cronin place. I told you last night, Mr. Dollar. The circumstances are different now, a lot different. We don't need a doctor. We need a coroner. A coroner? Where are you calling from? The operator told me the phone out there was out of order. It is. I'm at a forestry station a mile down the road. Jason Prell cut the wires last night before he was killed. Jason killed? Shot to death during the storm. So that's how he ended up. It took a long time, but everything finally comes home. Yes, Mrs. Cronin said the same thing an hour or so before she died. Dolly, too. Her heart, Mr. Dollar? In a way, maybe. The dancing darling. Finally at rest. She... What do you mean, in a way? Dr. Bigby, Mrs. Cronin was murdered. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar at the Cronin Estate, Wells Falls, New York, to the Home Office, Surety Mutual and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Cronin matter. Expense account, final page. Item 13, 10 cents. A half pack of cigarettes I left with a farmer who gave me a lift back from the forestry station. The price of my own feelings at the moment would have been lower. About eight cents lower, in fact. I brewed another pot of coffee and sat down to wait for Bigby. But this time I laced the coffee with brandy. The sun was up by then, clear of the horizon, bringing a bright new morning and a brand new day. The storm was long over, and the world sparkled and danced. But too much of the night was still with me, and the past still too much alive. And yet, maybe Dolly Cronin was better off. She was a part of that past now, where friends were always true. Every minute of life was even more wonderful than the last one. And where she was still, and forever, the dancing darling. Good morning, Johnny. Oh, hi, Sylvia. I'm in the coffee business this morning. How about it? Please. Mm. Having yours with cream, I see. Yeah, bad night. Shall I make yours the same way? Right. I had a bad night, too. Thanks. Hmm. You look real beat, Johnny. Couldn't be any beater. 
Something pretty terrible happened last night, didn't it? Yes. Jason Prell is dead. Oh. And Dolly Cronin is dead. Oh, no. I loved her, Johnny. I didn't mean what I said last night about life always having been too easy for her, and you were right. It was just being frustrated, tied in knots and covering up. I loved her. She was sweet. Yeah, she was quite a girl. She had something, I don't know. She had love. She loved people, and they loved her in return. Maybe so. Anyway, I guess this belongs to you now. The necklace? The circle of fire? What do you mean it belongs to me? She made a will last night. I witnessed it. She left the necklace to you. I just can't believe it. Johnny, can I... Can I put it on? Why not? It's yours. She wanted you to have it. You look good in it. I just can't believe it, Johnny. Well, before you get carried away too far, maybe you'd better brace yourself. Oh, it's not mine after all. Oh, it's yours, all right. But it's not real. What? It's a good copy, worth maybe four or five hundred dollars, but that's all. Well, I... I, I, I don't understand. It's so well known. The, the circle of fire, it's been written up over and over. Yeah, from old records. But nobody's really examined it for years, since before Barnaby Cronin died. It's been locked up in a bank vault until I took it out. Was there ever a real one? Yes, originally. But it was broken up and disposed of years ago. Jason Prell knew it. Was in on the substitution, I suppose. That's why he was so desperate to steal it from me and get rid of it before I found out it was a copy. He knew that if that deal came to light, it would call attention to some of his other activities. Worse ones. What do you mean? Prell had complete charge of Mrs. Cronin's estate. He told me it was worth practically nothing. But according to records I saw in New York, it amounted to over a million dollars in the beginning. He was stealing her blind all these years. Oh, it was easy. She was alone in the world, knew nothing about business. She trusted him, thought he was her friend. She trusted everybody, much too much. Well, she sure trusted the wrong ones, including her husband. Barnaby? Sure. What do you think disposed of the necklace and slipped her a copy after making such a big deal out of his fabulous wedding gift? A phony. And she worshipped him. The king. In her book, The Man Who Could Do No Wrong. Well, in the business book, he didn't do much else but wrong. According to the records, most of his deals were pretty shady. Especially after he and Prell teamed up. Yes, Miss Atherton? Dr. Bigby is here to see you. All right, show him. Mr. Dollar, I wouldn't believe too much of what he says. He's a chronic drunk. Yes, I remember you telling me. Show him in. Yes, sir. Well, I was just thinking, Johnny. Mrs. Cronin didn't know any of this, I assume. No, she was safe in her dream world. And she thought she was giving me the real necklace. That's right. It's crazy. And kind of wonderful, isn't it? (laughs) Just like that, she gave me something she thought was worth a half a million dollars. Just because I was nice to her and liked her. You know something, Johnny? What? I'm just as glad it is a copy. It's beautiful, and and I love wearing it. I'd have been scared of the real one. And I'll always remember that, like that dream world of hers, she thought it was real. One more question left, but a big one. The question of murder. And I already had the answer. I was sure of it. And I knew there was nothing I could do about it. Dr. Bigby was a man under 60, but he looked years older, a harried man, tired and worn. He sat down for a moment and we talked. And I began to realize that here was another man who'd been under Dolly Cronin's spell. And who was shocked and hurt by her dying. It was a remarkable thing and a difficult one to explain, Mr. Dollar. Like many another, I suppose, I often wondered why I felt the way I did about her. It was a a sort of magic she had. Yeah, I know. Even as a girl here in the village, she had that same power and had it without knowing it. Everybody loved her. No, not quite everybody. At least one person didn't. Yes, you mentioned on the phone the word murder. That's right, Dr. Bigby. Who killed her? A man we can't touch because he's already dead. Jason Prell. Well, he's done about everything else, I guess. I wouldn't put it past him. What do you base it on, Mr. Dollar? A bottle of pills. Prell supposedly went to Tupper's Lake last night and got a prescription filled for Mrs. Cronin. 
She took some of it this morning, an hour and a half before she died. There it is. I'd seen the bottle on the train coming up with a few tablets left on the same prescription. And these are different. Well, you're right on one count, Mr. Dollar. Those aren't what the prescription calls for. What do you mean, one count? I talked to the druggist at Tupper's Lake on the phone last night. He told me about Jason being in. All right, it still stands. He had the prescription filled and then changed the tablets, substituted these. It's possible. Would you happen to know what they are without having them analyzed? I've got a pretty good idea, but I'll wait until I've examined her before I'll say positively. Mr. Dollar, I'd like to explain why I wouldn't come out when you called me last night. Yeah, I wish you would. I'd been drinking. So I get it. I'd been drinking that other time, too, and I'd made a mistake. I didn't want to make another one. Just what do you mean? When Barnaby Cronin died here, I signed the death certificate. Yes, I know. I hadn't treated him. He was dead when I came out. I called it a heart attack. I was drunk. And I was wrong. Barnaby was poisoned. Go on. I didn't suspect it until later. And then I was afraid to do anything about it. I'd signed that certificate, and I knew it would break me. So I kept still. And I consoled myself with drink. And finally, it broke me. So the same end result was achieved. Look, Dr. Bigby, if Barnaby Cronin was here alone, then how was he poisoned? Alone? He wasn't alone when he died. She was here with him. Mrs. Cronin? Of course not. Why do you think he was always making trips up here, always by himself? I didn't know he was. For years, every week or two, the whole village knew about it. She was here with him that night. She's the one who called me, asked me to protect her good name. She's the one who poisoned him. And now she's had another try with the same poison. But why? Ask her why. Ring for her and ask her. That won't be necessary. <clears throat> well, I'll go on up and make my examination. Well, Miss Atherton, I'm asking, why? He was planning to break off our relation. He told me that night she'd finally won. That silly little fool had finally won. But I didn't let her win. I killed him. You're confessing to murder, you know. It doesn't matter now. I've accomplished everything I meant to accomplish. So it was you who changed the tablets in her prescription bottle and substituted the poison? Of course. It was so easy. For once in my life, things were just as easy for me as they'd always been for her. Will you have the sheriff come out, Mr. Dollar? I'd like to make my confession. <laughs> It's odd how things work out sometimes, Mr. Dollar. Yeah. Mrs. Cronin said something like that last night. I was pretty certain when you showed me the tablets, but I wanted to make my examination first. What do you mean? After Barnaby died and I started to suspect Miss Atherton, I managed to steal the poison from her in order to analyze it. I substituted harmless tablets of the same general appearance. And those are what she's kept all these years? What she gave to Mrs. Cronin? That's right. They were perfectly harmless. In that case... Dolly Cronin died from a heart condition. The tablets had nothing to do with it. In a sense, Dolly died the same way she lived. From natural causes. Expense account item 14, $83.90. Incidentals and transportation from Wells Falls back to Hartford. Expense account total, $263.30. End of account, end of report. Remarks... The insurance angle here seems a little muddy. Premiums were paid for years on an item that didn't exist. And yet, no claim was filed and none will be. So, well, I leave it to your legal eagles. Me, I'm beat and tired and maybe a little sad. I've come out of this with a kind of nostalgia. And for a time and place I never even knew. And I'm halfway in love with a girl back in that time and place. A girl I've never seen. Oh, sure, I know. It's a dream world and a dream girl. And none of it exists. But it's too bad. I wish it did. Because she must have been a honey. A real sweetheart. A dancing darling. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.
Remember, please, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, the story of a man worth $50,000 who didn't have a cent to his name. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Les Crutchfield, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Shirley Mitchell, Vivi Janis, Barbara Fuller, Benny Rubin, John Daner, and Parley Bear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Ha, <laughs> ha,